did indeed genuinely occur. Um, I'm not going to say much about this slide, but let me just uh, say that it was known that the average number of prime factors of a number near a number n is the logarithm of the logarithm of n. And if you want to work out what that is and you're not very familiar with logs, roughly speaking, you take the number of digits of your number, multiply by 2.3, take the number of digits of that, and multiply by 2.3. That means if you start with a very big number, you get quite a lot smaller number at the end of that process. Well, um, a very nice theorem of Hardy and Ramanujan, which was greatly simplified by Paul Turan, was that actually not only is that the average, but most numbers are close to the average. Most numbers have roughly log log n prime factors, but the, the summit of this sort of theorem was the erdos katz theorem that resulted from this talk, that it really is true. This word normally distributed, this phrase, is a mathematical way of saying you do get a bell curve. Now, why is that a beautiful theorem? I've just, that's what it's supposed to be. Well, one reason is that there's something intrinsically satisfying about the normal distribution. Actually, it crops up absolutely everywhere in mathematics. It comes up in quantum mechanics. You name it, the normal distribution is everywhere. And so mathematicians who are used to it think of it as a very simple object. Another reason is that uh, it reveals some sort of hidden structure in the primes. If I draw that picture, you don't really see a bell curve. You see a very vague suggestion of one, but you don't actually see it. And if you really wanted to see it, you'd have to produce an enormous number of factorizations, which is really beyond what one could reasonably do. So it's sort of hidden in the sense that you can't directly uh, appreciate it. A third thing is I think that it's just a completely outrageous conjecture to make in the first place that uh, probability should have anything to do with the primes. And the fourth one, perhaps the most important of all, is that the proof is very beautiful. And I would just like very briefly to uh, sketch that. So this is what was going on in Erdős's mind during the latter part of Katz's talk. Most numbers, as was known, have about log log n prime factors. I'm going to do it in very brief qualitative terms. Therefore, most prime factors of most numbers near n are small, because if they're too large, then they would multiply to something bigger than n. Um, then you look at whether the number is even, whether it's divisible by 3, whether it's divisible by 5. Um, a tool called the Brun sieve tells us that those events are sort of roughly independent. Now, Erdős, unlike Katz, lived and breathed the Brun sieve. That was really his big advantage. Um, had they been precisely independent, then you would expect a normal distribution, because that's where normal distributions come in. And 5, the most important of all, if you then add the numbers, you don't say small, large, and that kind of thing, you can actually get that sketch of an argument to work. That's something I'd like to stress, because there are many romantic stories about mathematicians who uh, are going for a walk in the mountains, and they suddenly have an idea, and they know that they just have to go back home and write it all out, and uh, they've got a wonderful theorem. There are some very famous examples of that. Um, a more common experience for me is I suddenly have this wonderful idea, and I say to my wife, Emily, I think I've got it now. <laughs> Uh, can I just go upstairs for a while? And so I go upstairs. A little bit later, I come downstairs. A little bit later still, she uh, finally gets around to asking, how did it go? I say, oh, so yes, no, it didn't really work. <laughs> and I think that's probably, for every uh, romantic experience where it does work, there are probably 99 that don't. And that's for the benefit of non-mathematicians. And mathematicians will, of course, know that what I'm saying is true, unless they're very different from me. Now I'm doing something uh, rather ambitious, not exactly attempting to define beauty, but at least to say a little bit about what beauty sometimes involves. So symmetry is obviously often a component of beauty and balance, sort of nice compositions. Um, some sort of tension between simplicity and complexity. If something is too simple, it's not beautiful because you can just see at a glance what it is. If it's too complicated, it's just completely haphazard and you can't really appreciate it. But something in between is where beauty seems to appear. Similar tension between regularity, irregularity, predictability, and unpredictability, and patterns that you can sort of appreciate but not immediately understand. And I think the Erdős katz theorem has many of those uh, qualities. I've got a few uh, pictures here. I'm hoping that you will agree with me that this arrangement of squares here is m more beautiful than this one. Of course, neither is spectacularly beautiful, but this one is somehow a bit more satisfying than this one. Now, there is a perfectly sound mathematical reason for this. I've got a 13 by 13 grid, and here I take every eighth square going along like this, and here I take every ninth square. Now, 8 and 13 are consecutive Fibonacci numbers, so the ratio 8 to 13, or 13 to 8, is close to the uh, golden ratio, 
and for very good mathematical reasons that tends to lead to a nice balanced arrangement, whereas here I've got, uh, I'm taking every ninth square, and three nines are 27, which is close to 2 13s, 26, and that leads to these rather unsatisfying sort of vertical seeming stripes. Here I took the graph mod 13, this is just for the benefit of mathematicians, of x squared against x, and it's a zero along the bottom. And here I took a completely random arrangement. I chose each square with probability 1 over 8. And it's quite interesting to compare them. The random one is actually not completely unsatisfying, I think. It's got a certain balance to it. Um, this one's got a, a bit of symmetry. You can actually make these comparisons. So I think it's not completely outrageous to talk about beauty in mathematics. So I hope that even if the erdos katz theorem has not just given you an intense aesthetic experience, you can at least see how it might do so for those who spend their lives devoted to mathematics. I would like to end by returning to the word importance, because, interestingly enough, the beauty of some mathematics contributes to its importance. This is not just because we want as much beauty in the world as possible. After all, the beauty of higher mathematics is appreciated by only a tiny minority of the world's population. The more serious reason is that there is a remarkable correlation between mathematics that is beautiful and mathematics that is important. This is partly for reasons internal to mathematics. There are two ways in which the subject develops. One is the solution of problems, which involves clever, unexpected ideas and hard technical work in varying proportions. Now, if mathematics were nothing but problem solving, then as it grew and grew, it would become more and more chaotic, specialized, and difficult. And indeed, to some extent, this does in fact happen. Fortunately, there is a tendency in the opposite direction as well. It often happens that there are similarities between the solutions to problems or between the structures that are thrown up as part of the solutions. Sometimes these similarities point to more general phenomena that simultaneously explain several different pieces of mathematics. These more general phenomena can be very difficult to discover, but when they are discovered, they have a very important simplifying and organizing role and can lead to the solutions of further problems or raise new and fascinating questions. I've just argued that a serious component of aesthetic appreciation is the feeling that a complicated pattern has been generated in a simple way, but not so that one can immediately apprehend it. It should not come as a total surprise, therefore, that when a number of loosely related specific results turn out to be consequences of the same general one, mathematicians should have an aesthetic response. In fact, an appreciation of beauty is essential, or at least very useful indeed, for solving problems as well. Often one can reject a line of attack on the grounds that it is simply not elegant enough to work. One may be wrong, but it is still efficient to look for beautiful solutions first and settle for ugly ones only as a last resort. Similarly, finding the solution of a problem involves a great deal of rather vague reasoning, following hunches, making guesses, and so on. How does one know whether one of these guesses will survive a later, more rigorous scrutiny? Well, one doesn't, as I stressed earlier, but it is a good rule of thumb that the more beautiful the guess, the more likely